Can we just ring our bells, everybody? Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Well, as you can see today, our theme is bells. In fact, as a faith community throughout the entire month of December, our focus has been specifically on the bells of Christmas. And as a result, I picked up a new hobby through this last month, and that is simply collecting bells. So I want to just show you some of the bells that I've collected over this past month and uh, didn't think that I would ever pick up a new hobby, but here I am. So this, by the way, this bell, you can kind of barely hear it, but this is our dog Gumba's bell whenever he wants to get out, so he wants to go outside. So he just uses his nose, and this is his bell, kind of cool to the collection. This is a nice holiday bell. Sounds nice, huh? Yeah. And then this here is a bell that you would put on the tip of your fishing pole to indicate that there's a fish on. Yeah, that's a pretty cool bell. And then this classic, this is a good old cowbell. More cowbell, okay. And then my favorite, this is simply a desk bell. Lots of bells over here. And then of course, let's all do this together. We got our bells with us tonight. And then, and in any case, I misplaced these bells, no worries. We are in the 21st century. I have a bell app. And I have different sounds. There's, that's a nice sound. And then a little bit of bass. And then, there. So, it's all about bells tonight. And uh, I'm thankful that I have a new hobby. So, with that, bells are one of the common symbols of Christmas. Because all throughout history, bells have been used to play the role of the angels on that first Christmas. Bells ring forth the message of joy. Say joy. joy. It rings the message of joy. We can see that the bell and the babe of Bethlehem are uniquely linked in many ways. The wise men were led by sight to the Savior. God gave them a star. But the shepherds were led by sound. God gave them a message through the ear. Both are part of God's methods, and both of them touch us all in all the sounds and sights of Christmas. They convey a message of good news. There are kiddos saying about that. Jesus was, he is God's word, and he came to be heard. He came to sound forth a message of joy and liberty and peace and joy. Reading from Luke chapter 2, a familiar passage, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, and I have it on the screen behind me. This is what it says. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. I want to ask a simple question this afternoon. And it's this, what is the sound of Christmas? What is the sound of Christmas? Now, if a bell were to ever ask, why was I created? You know, what is my life's purpose? That's them, you know, as if they were talking. <clears throat> well, he might say, 
I was created to make sound. This is why I was created. My life purpose is used to get your attention because something important precedes my sound. And this is why the Salvation Army, for example, uses them. Bells are used to call people to an awareness of something that they should be in on. Bells mean it's time to board a train. All aboard. The doorbell or phone bell. That's sound. It calls your attention to what? It means that someone is trying to contact you. The recess bell. There are two drastic responses to the recess bell. Kids say, bummer, recess is over. But the teacher says, dang, my break of peace and quiet is over. <laughs> you know, I hear a certain bell almost every day, and this is my office in Galt, which is the coffee shop bakery. If you've not been there, that's an amazing place. The coffee shop bakery, actually, when you walk in, you'll see the picture here. There's the bell. And what, are the, what is that indicating? What is that bell saying when somebody walks in or walks out? It's announcing, I'm here, or I'll see you later. The church bell, another bell, calls you to the worship of God. Christmas bells are to call your attention to the fact that God has done a miracle in the gift of his son, which is the basis for a never-ending joy. Say joy. This sound is to remind and show us that Jesus lifted man from the pit of despair to the pinnacle of delight. Christmas bells are a call to attention to God's unconditional love, un am an amazing, unending kind of love, full of 100% grace, nothing, nothing that we don't deserve, but yet because of his love, this is Christmas. This is the sound. And so what is that sound? It is this. Do not be afraid, the angel of the Lord said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Say joy. joy. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You know, among many other sounds, there's something unique about a bell that draws, that, that, when it comes to a bell, it draws our attention. Don't you think that the creators of Facebook, for example, know about this? They actually do. You may have not known this, but the notifications on your Facebook is actually a symbol of a bell. Some of you maybe have seen the, Net, um, the Netflix series, The Social Dilemma. How many of you said that, seen that? Pretty eye-opening, interesting stuff there. And what that series or that what the episode showed was that there is actually an addiction there's actually in our in our makeup endorphins that go off when we hear the sound of a bell the power of social media you know this christmas my hope and prayer is that you would truly know the sound because there is a sound above all other sounds to get our attention and to bring you and i to our knees, to surrender and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. What is it about that particular sound? What is it about the message of Christmas that we need to be reminded this afternoon and also beyond, even after today? Well, here are a few things I want to leave with you. The first thing is that God doesn't heap more fear. He seeks to eliminate it. One more time, God doesn't heap more fear. He actually seeks to eliminate it. And I need to reassure all of us, all of you today with this. Do not be afraid. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. Do not be be afraid. This is significantly different, by the way, than the world's concern and not so subtle message that is their bell. The sound of the world's message is this not just be fearful, be more fearful. Be more fearful. 
This is the bell. This is the sound that we hear from the world. Be more fearful. And when it comes to the world's message, it is on repeat. It's, it's constantly on repeat. It's constant. And it does not and nor will it let up. If you crunch the numbers, now kind of follow this along with me. If you crunch the numbers and you feed your mind with constant messaging of fear, the odds of, living, of you living in fear will outweigh and also drown out the truth, the message of what God says. And this is why the Bible, for example, is extremely powerful. Why? Because it is God's written word and also promise to keep reminding you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I will never leave you or abandon you. It's the opposite message from what the world says. And this is also why it's powerful to be partners in a family within a faith community, being in a church of victors in Jesus' name, not victims, can help and strengthen us. It is strength in numbers, knowing that we are not alone. We walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite verses, whenever I feel fear coming on me, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen? You are invited, by the way, to partner with us on the journey of what it means to love God and love people. That's the journey we're on here at Living Water Church, and here we are getting rooted in, in, in Wilton. We are real people serving a real God through love and mission. Among our other intentional times of togetherness, we meet here on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. When the angel showed up, there was immediate fear. In fact, the Bible describes it as not just fear, they were terrified. Say terrified. terrified. They were terrified. What was spoken in that moment would bring a reminder and a reassurance, do not be afraid. And what this means is God always gives the diagnosis before the cure. And I'm going to repeat that. God always gives the diagnosis before the cure. By the way, do you know how many times in the Bible where the words fear not or do not be afraid show up? How many times? 365. That's one for every day. I think God knows our tendencies that we have when it comes to fear. But do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I will not leave you. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God will never give you the spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. What is it about the particular sound? What is it also about the message of Christmas that we need to be reminded of this afternoon and beyond? It's this. Christmas is a message of peace and joy. Say joy. joy. Christmas is a message of peace and joy. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Now, here's the thing. There's such thing as joy, but as we see here, there's great joy. Say great joy. More than ever before, there is a desperate longing for peace and for hope and for joy and for victory today. The sound, the message of Christmas provides all of that and more. If you have the peace of eternal life in Christ, guess what? You have a bell to ring. If you possess hope in Christ, when many feel hopeless today, you have a bell to ring. If the joy of Christ resides deep in your, in your soul, despite joylessness, you have a bell to ring. If you've experienced victory over loss and great grief and difficulty or illness, you have a bell to ring. Another bell that's quite interesting is, you know, there are many bell sounds in a hospital, good and bad, but none better than the sound of a bell when rung because a patient completes their prescribed course of oncology or cancer treatments. And this is an example of what happens. 
ringing a bell, got the nurses supporting, got other family and friends in the background celebrating a survivor's bell. And I'm here to tell you this afternoon that me, I, myself, I have a survivor's bell that I ring every day. In fact, I'm thankful that I'm even here this afternoon standing here talking to you because not too long ago, it was actually pretty grim. Back in March, I ended up getting COVID. And this, is a, this was actually me in the emergency room after about two and a half weeks of a fever that never went down. It was about 102.5. And as I watched my wife get better in 10 days, I actually got worse. In fact, she went away for a weekend, and when she came home, she made a comment, and she said, Rob, you need to get to the doctor because you're not breathing right. And I'd like to say that what probably most likely put me in the hospital was what I think some of us can relate to is what's called male stubbornness. I don't need to go to the doctor. I'll take care of it myself. Anybody can relate? Yes. So this was me. And finally, when my wife told me, get to the hospital, I did. And what was revealed was as the doctor did my x-ray, this was my x-ray. And by the way, black is actually good. White is not. That's correct, right, Kara? Yeah. And the doctor said, Rob, this is the worst text x-ray that I've ever seen. And what he, he was explaining to me he was almost looking at me like, I can't even believe I'm talking to you because what's happening, my oxygen levels, by the way, if your oxygen level drops below 90%, that's a very severe thing. My oxygen level at the time was in the 60 percentile. And what was happening was my organs, the doctor was explaining to me that my organs were about ready to shut down. And I didn't feel any different. I just knew that I couldn't breathe really well. And so he said, because of this, your stay here at the hospital will be minimum one month. And my wife and I, at the time when we got the news, it wasn't good news at all. And as we continued through this process, I had the idea, I got a lot of bad news in that process, that I was really sick and I needed to get better, and not only sick, but on the verge of death. I got admitted, this was the week before Easter, I got admitted on Monday at 3 o'clock. On Wednesday morning, my alarms went off, and the nurses and specialists and doctors had a panic look on their face, and they said, we need to rush you right now to the ICU and intubate you because your oxygen levels are dropping and they're not recovering. Also, your heart rate is dropping and not recovering. I didn't feel any different because I was medicated, and I was just kind of going along with it. And the doctor was very well about keeping my wife posted and updated as to all the things that were happening with me. And he called and he said, Kara, this is what's happened. Your husband has taken a turn for the worst. We have to put a ventilator on him. And in tears, my wife said, is there anything else that we can do? And the doctor said, this is the last thing that we can do. And in tears and in more tears, Kara said, is there anything else that we can do? This was my doctor's diagnosis. He said, well, what we can do is we can storm heaven with our prayers. And let me tell you, if you don't believe this now, I'm here to tell you that prayer is actually, actually powerful and it works. We had estimated about 30,000 people praying for my healing. Our youth group, that Wednesday night, this was Wednesday, praying like for several hours out on the field of faith, right on Jeff Bryan Lane, praying and worshiping the church, praying. And I have to tell you that the doctor said to my wife, we will reevaluate tomorrow morning, Thursday morning. Wednesday night, my fever broke for the first time in almost three weeks. 
And on Thursday morning, I was able to get up out of bed and eat for the first time in two and a half, three weeks. And the doctors were coming in saying, what's going on? Why are you out of bed? <laughs> and I said, I feel great, doc. And he said, no, 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 no. We don't think that you're leaving anytime soon. And I said, well, okay, but I got a lot of people praying for us, for, for me and for my family. And he said, well, uh, okay, but we, I need you not to be in the, this is my other doctor, by the way, not the one that said we need to storm heaven with our prayers. I had three doctors. And the other one said, no, 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 that, that, I just need you to do this. Well, by Thursday night, I was doing physical therapy and walking around, and my heart rate was actually doing well, and my oxygen levels were doing well. Friday, which is Good Friday, the doctor came in and said, look, here's the deal. We can't explain what's happening because we haven't seen this in a year and a half. What I can tell you is you're a walking miracle. And I can tell you that if by Easter you're actually out of this hospital, it will be more than a miracle. And Sunday, that was Sunday, that Easter. And in that time, Kara got to come up and see me for that first time in that week. And uh, we got to celebrate Easter together in the hospital. And the doctor came in on Monday morning and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take you off of the oxygen and see how your body responds while you do physical therapy. On Monday, I did that. And the doctor came in and said, we can't explain this. All we can say is you're a walking miracle. The nurses, the doctors, all the specialists are dumbfounded. And here's what will happen. We're going to discharge you today at 3 o'clock. So I was admitted on Monday at 3 p.m. I was discharged on Monday at 3 p.m. It was exactly seven days. And if you realize the number of seven, it actually means perfection and completion in the spirit. Look, I am so grateful for my survivor's bell. You know, people have asked this question, Rob, because of your experience and how you got through COVID in a miraculous way, but so many others haven't, do you have survivor's guilt? Do you have survivor's guilt? I'm here to tell you as a testimony that two occasions while I was in the hospital in the middle of the night, I prayed to God and said, I, I don't feel like this is the end of me. I feel like you have more work for me to do. But if you call me home, I'm content. I'm here to tell you that I do not have survivor's guilt because the message from God is this. Because my message is good news of hope and peace and joy and victory. Go, therefore, and share because I am not done with you yet. The fact that we are all here tonight is a testimony of God saying to you, he is not done with you yet. You have a bell to ring. The final thing that I want to leave with you about the particular sound, the message of Christmas, that we need to be reminded of this afternoon and beyond is this. The real sound of Christmas is good news. Say good news. And let me just ask this question. How about some good news for once? How about some good news for once? Here it is. I bring you good news that will bring great joy. Say joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. There is never a better sound than this. The Savior, Messiah, is born. He will save people from their sins that separate them from God. The real sound is found in a person. It is Jesus, and this is good news. You know, it never gets old sharing my story, sharing my testimony of when Jesus, the Savior, pursued me and drew me to his great love and saved me. He gave me purpose. And when I was 12 years old, I saw my family just absolutely I mean, it was just a traumatic situation. My mom and dad were wanting to get a divorce. And, and at 12 years old, I, you know, I was taught that I was to never look at my dad's eyes when he talks or when I talk to him. And, you know, it was that day when he asked me, you know, your mom and I are going to end our marriage. Who do you want to live with? And I looked my dad straight in the eye and I said, 
I don't want to make that decision because I love you both. And the conclusion of that was the next day, it was Sunday. And my dad, being a very successful person on the outside, but a very empty person on the inside, he covered it a lot with alcohol and success and fame and all of that and trying and striving. But, you know, that was what it took. It took him to say, I am actually not a success. I am a failure and I need God. And he did. He gave his heart to the Lord driving from Southern California to Northern California, right on the freeway, on the 99 freeway, pulled over, and he said, I don't even know, God, if you're real, but if you are, I give you my life. I have to tell you that he came back a different person. I mean, he was leading Bible studies in our house, and our TV was removed, and I was like, what's going on? This is crazy. And, and it, was, it was like this amazing thing, this transformation that took place almost overnight. And I'm like, I wonder if this is truly real. And it was. It was. And I said, if God can change him and change that man, he can change anybody, including me. And a month later, I gave my heart to the Lord. And I said a beginner's prayer. And I said, Lord, I give you my heart. I know I'm a sinner. I accept you. Lead my life. Guide my life. I am all yours. You know, I want you, in closing, to just listen to these words This is where joy is found. This is where hope is found. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity the passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. That's joy. A bell's purpose is to not only be heard, it seeks a response. The response to the sound, the response to the message of Christmas can be, I believe and I receive. I open the gift. The question for you is, will you open the gift? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved, ringing a bell. Let's pray. I'm going to close out our time here and move into our Christmas carol time. I just feel it in my heart that I, I, I just want to, to do this. I, I want to ask a few questions. You know, maybe through this message or through this, through this uh, um, service, maybe it's the first time you've stepped into the doors of a, of a church or maybe you've been away for a while and you've been asking the question, I... I just feel empty. There's something missing in my life. I I want to say to you that God is calling you to come to him and give you his life and give you your life. Give him your life. To ask him to forgive you of all the sins that you have done. That's the diagnosis. The diagnosis is sin. It's we have our destiny is eternal separation from God. But because of what Jesus did, we have a new life. And my goal this afternoon is not to scare anyone into heaven because that kind of theology will actually not sustain over time. I'm here to tell you that God always meets us first in the diagnosis before providing the cure. Try going to the doctor, for example, and ask him or her to help you get better. And the doctor would say, "Uh, before I can give you a cure, cure, I need to know what's wrong. This is what God says to us. And admitting that you're a sinner, admitting that we fall short to the perfection and glory of God means that we can say yes to him and give him our lives. And if that's you, if you've never given your heart to the Lord or given uh, yourself to the Lord, your life to the Lord, I want to ask if you could just slip up your hand so I can pray for you. I want to pray for you. If that's you, if you want to give your life to Christ tonight or today. I want to pray for you. Thank you. God, I thank you 
that when one sinner repents, heaven is having a party. And God, even after this afternoon service and all the festivities of tonight and tomorrow, Lord, I pray that people who don't know you would come to know the Savior tonight, today. We thank you. Thank you for salvation. And then also I want to pray for those who maybe want to come back home. You've been away and you kind of feel God is disappointing, disappointed with you. Listen, he loves you. I'm so glad that you're here. You're not here by accident. And God's call is always to say, welcome home. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? If you want, if you're, if you've kind of like, you know, been on this journey and you're like, ah, you know, I, I don't even know if I could go to church anymore because I think God's mad at me. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Just slip your hand up so I can pray for you. Thank you. God, I pray for those who are desiring to come back to you. Lord, you are so gracious. You are so loving. Your forgiveness never ends. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give strength to those who want to come back. Lord, I pray that they would find a new version, a new understanding, a new reality of your grace and your love tonight. And then finally, I want to pray for those who want to strengthen, who want strength and courage to share the good news, who really want to ring that bell. But for some reason, there's just something that stops you. There's fear or there's uh, this, maybe you'll feel like you're going to get made fun of or whatever. If that's you, if you want strength and courage to continue to share the good news of Jesus, you want to ring that bell. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Could you please slip your hand up? If that's you, I want to pray that God give you the strength and courage Father, for these who have raised their hand, I pray that you would, by your spirit, give them strength and boldness. Lord, I pray that you would help them know that as they speak, you help them speak in the middle of speaking. God, give them boldness, give them courage, give them strength in your name. So, Lord, take all these commitments and seal it in your name. We thank you that the Savior is born in your name. Amen.